Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Joe Wiegand. I'm a medical physics resident at Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, yeah, the purpose of this lecture series is to provide a platform where people can get a high quality medical physics education regardless of where they are on the planet. Uh, so welcome to the inaugural lecture. Uh, this one on the physical principles of ultrasound. So I apologize to the people who are more clinically minded, but this talk is gonna be more focused on uh, the physics and engineering of ultrasound, where in a later lecture, I'm going to focus on more of the clinical aspects. Uh, I always figure you have to know the, the physics and engineering first to really understand the artifacts and, and other clinical considerations. Yeah, so ultrasound is an imaging modality that was developed after World War II. It came about due to a lot of the underwater sonar research. Uh, basically, this device known as a transducer produces an ultrasound wave. The wave is then allowed to propagate into the patient. It comes across an interface or a structure, an anatomic structure that it's trying to image. And part of it will be transmitted, but the other part of it will be reflected backwards, where it can then be detected by that same transducer. And one can then determine the depth of this structure by time of flight method. So basically determining how long the ultrasound wave took to travel from that structure and back, and then knowing the speed of sound in tissue, you can then determine how deep that structure was. The amplitude of an echo is encoded by a grayscale value. So something like bone, which is very reflective, will show up as a very bright grayscale value. And something like air will show up as a dark grayscale value. So the main application of ultrasound is a fetal ultrasound. Now this is due to the fact that other imaging modalities are deemed not so safe for uh, imaging fetuses. Uh, obviously ionizing radiation can be quite damaging on fetuses. So CT, X-ray, mammography, these, these imaging modalities are often contra contraindicated unless it's an emergency. Um, MRI, it's, it's a little bit less clear. Uh, there's not really evidence that, well, that MRI is dangerous for pregnant women, but people tend to err on the side of caution and not want to expose a pregnant woman to a very high magnetic field. So the default imaging modality that is definitely deemed safe is then ultrasound. So whenever you see people look at images of their, their baby, it's definitely ultrasound. <clears throat> Main reason why I'm interested in ultrasound is because I have a very strong interest in global health and ultrasound is far and away the most common imaging modality in the developing world. So shown here is a figure taken from a manuscript about 15 years ago about a number of people getting trained on an ultrasound unit in a refugee camp on the eastern shore of Lake Tanganyika. So these refugees were fleeing the ethnic violence that has stricken the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo for the last like 28 years or so. Um, and there's refugee camps sort of scattered all over the area. Obviously, there aren't doctors or trained radiologists and sophisticated equipment at these refugee camps, um, but a lot of them do have ultrasounds, and those are the ways that uh, the people at the refugee camp, working at the refugee camp, uh, can help diagnose the, the inhabitants. And if there is a larger problem, they could then send them off to uh, larger cities in the area like Bukavu or Goma to actually get uh, care for whatever they find. So the main reason why ultrasound is very important in a global health setting is mainly it's low cost, um, but also a lot of other convenient features. So it's small size makes it quite portable. Uh, it's very reliable. It's an immediate readout that doesn't need to uh, be read by a radiologist. It can be read just by a technician. <clears throat> and the fact that you're not relying on ionizing radiation so there's not the same level of regulatory infrastructure that you have to go about when uh, installing an ultrasound unit. But yeah, let's jump right into the basic physics of ultrasound. And first, we're going to start by reviewing some basic physics properties 
of sound and what how waves work. Uh, so what is sound, right? We hear it all the time, but often we don't really think about it. Um, but basically it's a mechanical energy that propagates through a continuous elastic medium via these phenomena known as compression and rarefaction. So compression and rarefaction can be illustrated uh, looking at this figure here to the left, where you have a spring that is uh, fastened on the right-hand side. So if you push the spring to the, to the right, sorry, <clears throat> the molecules in the spring will compress. And this is the phenomenon of compression, right? And it will have the tendency to want to push back leftwardly to equilibrium position, right? And this tendency to want to push back leftwardly sort of describes an increase in the pressure of the molecules, right? Conversely, if you pull the spring to the left, the molecules in the, in the spring will spread out. This is known as rarefaction. Um, and here you have the same level of pressure, but it's actually a negative pressure because it wants to pull it back inward, right? So actually as the spring oscillates in space, it undergoes these pressure oscillations in time where the pressure will go to a maximum when it's completely compressed and a minimum when it's completely experiencing rarefaction. <clears throat> so there are two main types of waves, uh, transverse waves, which are what are normally thought of in the general population when you hear the word waves. So here the displacement of the medium is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Right, water waves are a common everyday example of this. Uh, when we're talking about physics, electromagnetic waves are a very common example of this. So it's interesting to note that the other imaging modalities utilize electromagnetic, hence transverse waves to interrogate an atom. So in ionizing radiation, right, ionizing radiation is itself an electromagnetic wave. And in MRI, you're utilizing this radio frequency wave, which is a lower energy electromagnetic wave. So the other major modal imaging modalities utilize these transverse waves. <clears throat> While ultrasound, on the other hand, utilizes these um, longitudinal waves, where the displacement of the medium is in the same direction as the propagation. And this was a little bit more counterintuitive when I first encountered this topic. So you can think of this uh, sort of old time children's toy, the slinky, right? And if you fasten the slinky to the left end, right? And then you oscillate it from the right end, this will produce a wave. And that wave's displacement will be along the direction of the propagation. So this is a longitudinal wave. And sound works a lot like this. <clears throat> So a few uh, basic principles that we need to review. So the wavelength of a wave, which is denoted by the small Greek letter lambda, is the distance between successive compressions and rare fractions when we're talking about sound. Uh, in general, when you're talking about any wave, it's basically just the distance of, through which uh, the wave starts to repeat itself. Uh, in medical ultrasound, we're talking about wavelengths on the order of 150 to 770 microns in soft tissue and less in air. So 33 to 165 microns in air. And the wavelength is important because it ultimately is what determines the spatial resolution along the direction of propagation. Uh, two related concepts are those of frequency and period. So uh, frequency is essentially the number of oscillations per unit time. So audible sound, the sound that my voice is making right now, uh, oscillates at a frequency from 15 hertz to 20 kilohertz. <clears throat> Any sound oscillating above 20 kilohertz is deemed as ultrasound, but uh, medical ultrasound usually operates in the range from two to 10 megahertz. And the period, which is quite related, is the time required for a single oscillation it's just one over the frequency. So the speed that sound propagates through a medium is dependent on which medium it's propagating on. And it's calculated by this formula here on the top left, where the speed of sound C is the square root of B over rho. 
where B is the bulk modulus. Essentially, it tries to quantify the stiffness of the medium or how much it resists being compressed, right? And rho is the density of the medium. Uh, the important thing to note, as I said, uh, the speed of sound is medium dependent. And it's often good to have in your memory the speeds of sound in these common media. So the speed of sound in air is 330 meters per second. In soft tissue, it's 1,540 meters per second. And in fat, it's 1,450 meters per second. But in each medium, it has a slightly different speed of sound. And whenever you're relating these uh, wave properties in physics, not just in ultrasound, uh, you can relate the different um, properties to each other, the speed of sound, the wavelength, and the frequency by this equation shown here in the top middle, C equals lambda F. Another uh, physics phenomenon that we should probably discuss is interference. So here, <clears throat> when you have an array of sound transmitters, they can cause interference. This interference can be constructive, destructive, or some arbitrary combination of the two. So constructive interference is illustrated here in the top figure, uh, where you have two waves that are oscillating at the same frequency, um, but they're completely in phase. Hence, when you combine them, their amplitudes add on top of each other. Uh, you also have the concept of destructive interference. Here, the waves are, again, oscillating at the same frequency, but they're 180 degrees out of phase with each other. And hence, uh, their amplitudes subtract from each other. Uh, the more general pattern is a more complex interference pattern shown here, where you have just these superposition of uh, different waves. And the, the interference pattern is ultimately determined by the amplitude of the two waves, the frequency of the two waves, and the phase difference between the two waves. So as we said, when sound propagates, uh, it undergoes these uh, pressure, amplitude, pressure amplitude oscillations through time. Uh, we can also speak of intensity, which is just proportional to the square of the pressure. So where the pressure can be negative, intensity is always positive, right? And the units of intensity are milliwatts per centimeter squared. But often in ultrasound, when we're talking about changes of intensity, we use this scale known as decibels, uh, which is defined here as 10 times the log base 10 of the ratio of the intensities. So basically, if you increase the, the decibels by 3 dB, you're actually increasing the, the intensity by a factor of two. And if you increase the decibels by 30 dB, you're actually increasing the intensity by a factor of a thousand. So now let's talk about what happens with this, these ultrasound waves once they interact with matter. Uh, so the first important uh, property that I need to describe is that of acoustic impedance. You guys are familiar with electrical impedance. It's quite analogous to that. Uh, basically, it describes the lack of flexibility of a compressible medium, right? And the important thing is that the reflection of the ultrasound waves is driven by interfaces with large differences in this acoustic impedance. So when you have two interfaces that have different acoustic impedances, that will cause the, the sound wave to be reflected backwards, and hence we could then detect it, right? Uh, acoustic impedance is defined as the product between the density and the speed of sound, and its unit is the rail, which is kilograms per meter squared per second. Yeah, so reflection is ultimately... Yeah, so reflection is ultimately driven by uh, acoustic impedance differences. And so we can first consider the case where uh, the sound wave is incident on a boundary at, at a 90 degree angle. So it's a transverse incidence as shown here in the figure. And right, so here you have two different uh, possibilities, right? The sound will either be reflected backwards or it will be transmitted through the wave. 
And when we want to quantify how much will be reflected, we could do so by this intensity reflection coefficient, R sub i, which is a fraction of sound in intensity incident on a boundary that is reflected, right? And it's defined up, up here on the top right formula. And as you can see, it's dependent on the acoustic impedance difference between the two media. You can also talk about the intensity transmission coefficient, which is just one minus the reflection coefficient uh, because the sound is either transmitted or reflected. And it's often useful to remember that uh, when traveling from a low acoustic impedance medium to a high acoustic impedance medium, uh, it will undergo the sound wave will undergo 180 degrees phase shift in pressure amplitude. And all of this, we were talking about transverse incidence, but the more general case is when the uh, ultrasound wave is incident from a non-transverse angle. So it's incident at an angle to the interface. And here, the law of reflection holds where the incident angle will be equal to the reflected angle. So it'll just bounce back at exactly the same angle. And these angles are defined here in the figure. So as you can see, if it's incident, it it's non-transversely incident on a boundary, uh, it will just bounce back at the same angle. Um, but what's more important is that when it's transmitted, it will actually undergo a change in angle. This phenomenon is known as refraction. And refraction is quantified by uh, Snell's law, named after the uh, old Dutch physicist Snellius. Uh, and here that says the sine of the transmitted angle divided by the sine of the in incident angle is equal to the ratio of the speed of sound in the two media. And when the speed of sound in the second media is bigger than the first, then the transmitted angle will be bigger than the incident angle. And when the speed of sound is bigger in the first media, then the incident angle will be bigger than the transmitted angle. And you also have this phenomenon known as total reflection, which occurs when the incident angle is greater than this critical angle. And the critical angle is shown here in the bottom left formula. Uh, so what can also happen with these sound waves as they traverse matter is that they can be scattered, right? And that's actually the phenomenon that we rely on on producing an image. We, we uh, would like the, yeah, so we would like the wave to be uh, reflected backwards, right? So there are sort of two different classes of boundaries, right? Specular or smooth reflectors, where here the dimensions of the boundary are much greater than the wavelength of the sound that's incident on this. This is basically a smooth boundary where the, the laws of reflection and, and what we just discussed in regards to reflection and transmission hold, right? There are also these non-specular or diffuse reflectors, which are quite jagged with respect to the wavelength of the sound. So here, the sound can be reflected in any given direction. And since we're only putting the transducer to receive the signal at a given place in the, at the surface of the patient, right? You're not receiving the, the sound that is reflected at a large angle here. So ultimately this non-specular reflection causes a decrease in the amplitude of the returning echoes since you're not going to be uh, receiving all of the returned echo. Uh, also, it's important to note that non-specular reflection increases with frequency, while specular reflection is more or less independent of frequency. So we can talk about attenuation, <clears throat> which is a caused by this absorption and scatter. And here, the important thing to note is that higher frequency sound is more attenuating. So this is shown here in the figure on the bottom right, where you have a two megahertz beam, which uh, penetrates quite deeply into the patient, where a 10 megahertz beam only penetrates maybe two centimeters. Uh, we can talk about, analogously to, as we talk about ionizing radiation, we can also talk about uh, attenuation coefficient, which for soft tissue, usually equals around a half a decibel per centimeter per megahertz. 
So let's switch gears and talk about uh, some of the more engineering features. So uh, specifically talking about transducer design. So here's the general schematic of a transducer. Basically, um, you have this coaxial cable, which connects the transducer to the readout electronics. You have this plastic case and metal shield, which are there for structural stability. You have the acoustic absorber and the backing block, which is there to attenuate the, the vibration of the elements. Uh, the magic happens in ultrasound in this piezoelectric element. And then the most distal part of a transducer is the matching layer. And we're gonna talk about some of the more important components of this transducer. So the most important thing is the piezoelectric element. Because the piezoelectric element is a property of some materials, those deemed piezoelectric materials, which undergo this piezoelectric effect. Right? And the piezoelectric effect is essentially the conversion of electrical energy into mechanical energy. That's what we use to produce the ultrasound waves. And, light, and analogously, you can also convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. And that's what we do when we want to detect the ultrasound that is coming back to the transducer. So let's uh, look a little bit more deeply into the physics of what is happening in this piezoelectric effect. So initially, if you have this piezoelectric material, they have a bunch of electric dipoles that are initially in equilibrium with each other. If you then expose this media to uh, physical compression, right, a mechanical force, right, this will cause the dipoles to be perturbed and they will slightly rearrange each other and these slightly rearranging electric dipoles being migrating electric charge will induce a voltage across the element, right? And this voltage is hence an electrical signal, right? In the analogous way, an electrical signal will cause a uh, mechanical wave. <clears throat> so there are many uh, piezoelectric materials. In ultrasound, we typically historically use these synthetic piezoelectric ceramics, the most common one being this PZT, which is uh, lead zirconate titanate. <clears throat> and sort of one of the older designs are these resonance transducers, where here you have an ultra short voltage pulse, which induces this piezoelectric effect. And then the transducers preferentially emit ultrasound with a wavelength given by twice the thickness of the, twi the twice the thickness of the element, right? So by changing the thickness of your transducer element, right, you're changing the frequency of the wave that is emitted, right? So let's say we wanted to emit an ultrasound wave with five megahertz, for example, right? So you would use that formula I showed you in the beginning to solve for the wavelength, right? Where the wavelength equals the speed of sound divided by the frequency. The speed of sound is four kilometers per second, right? That's the speed of sound in PZT, right? And then the frequency is the frequency that we're trying to get at five megahertz. And we would see that we would want a wavelength of 0.8 millimeters. Hence, we would design a resonance transducer that is 0.4 millimeters. Uh, you also have the damping block, which is uh, proximal to the piezoelectric element. Here, this is there to absorb the backwards directed ultrasound energy and attenuate stray ultrasound signals from the housing. So because of this backing block, you have this phenomenon known as ring down, right? The backing block caused dampening of the oscillations. Right. And this hence lessens the purity of the resonant frequency by causing the waves to oscillate at many different frequencies. And hence that introduces a broadband frequency spectrum. Right. And this ring down is quantified via this parameter known as the quality factor Q, which is designed, which is defined as the resonant frequency divided by the bandwidth where the bandwidth is just basically the range in frequency space that the, that the wave oscillates, right? And here, if you have a high quality factor, you have a narrow bandwidth, and this is when you have very light dampening. And if you have a low quality factor, you have a lot of dampening, and then you have a broad bandwidth. 
right? And a wall and a short pace spatial pulse line. Uh, so for imaging, we want a low quality factor so that we're actually able to detect waves of slightly different frequencies, right? But if we're doing something like Doppler imaging, which I'll talk about in the next ultrasound lecture, uh, here you want a high quality. Yeah, so the matching layer is the most distal part of the transducer, and this is there to provide interface between the transducer and the tissue. So remember we said that reflection is driven by acoustic impedance differences. And uh, the acoustic impedance in PZT material is very different from the acoustic impedance in uh, the patient skin, right? So it, essentially what the matching layer does is you introduce layers of material with acoustic impedances that are intermediate to that of the transducer layer and tissue so that you gradually step down in acoustic impedance. The thickness of each layer is around a quarter of a wavelength. And additionally, you add acoustic gel to eliminate air pockets. Uh, what is more common though, uh, are these non-resonance transducers, uh, also called multi-frequency or bro broadband transducers. So basically you have these finely machined PZT rods, you then fill it in with this epoxy backfill. And this allows for the center frequency to be adjusted in transmit mode. So most transducers that are actually used are these non-resonance transducers so that we can actually adjust the frequency based on the depth that we're trying to image, right? And here you don't need these uh, multiple matching layers. You have these multi-frequency or multi-hertz transducers uh, shown here, right? Multi-frequency, you have this very broad band, right? It could be 80% of the resonant frequency. And these multi-hertz transducers are important for harmonic imaging where you actually are uh, uh, exciting and receiving over many different resonant frequencies. Uh, most transducers <clears throat> we use today are not single transducer elements, but they're actually arrays. <clears throat> and there's a few different types of arrays, right? So there are linear arrays. Uh, usually these contain between 256 and 512 elements. And the idea is that you, nor you simultaneously fire a small group, maybe 20 elements at a time. The width of each element is around a half of a wavelength, and these uh, produce a rectangular field of view. There are also these curvilinear arrays, which produce the trapezoidal field of view that we're very used to seeing in ultrasound as well. Uh, so you have uh, phased arrays as well, which usually contain less elements uh, between 64 and 128, but they're a little bit more sophisticatedly uh, programmed. So here you don't activate the elements simultaneously, but they're nearly simultaneous. In particular, you introduce these fractional timing delays. And by introducing small timing delays about when the elements are fired, you're able to steer and focus the beam, right? You then need these uh, slightly more sophisticated imaging reconstruction algorithm to produce the image. So let's talk about uh, properties of an ultrasound beam, right? So here is a general schematic of a typical ultrasound beam. Uh, here, the horizontal direction is the direction of propagation. And as you can see, the ultrasound beam first starts to converge, then comes to a point where it's, it's skinniest, and then starts to diverge, right? So we basically break the, the beam up into these two regimes, the near field, and the far field where they are converging and diverging respectively. Uh, so the near field is also known as the Fresnel zone, named after the French physicist, Augustin Fresnel. Um, basically here, the plane of the transducer can be modeled as an infinite number of point sources, each emitting a radial wave, right? And you can actually use Huygens' principle, named after the Dutch physicist Christian Huygens, to determine the interference pattern produced 
by these infinite number of radio waves. So this is shown here in the figure on the left where you have many of these radio waves. And actually, when you calculate their interference pattern, this actually causes the beam to converge in the near field. The length of the near field can be calculated by the, the diameter of the piezoelectric element and the frequency or the wavelength, right? So if you have a higher frequency or a larger diameter element, you would have a longer Fresnel zone and uh, vice versa for a lower frequency or a smaller diameter. So the far field is known as the Fraunhofer zone. Now, this is named after the German physicist Joseph von Fraunhofer. And uh, here is where the beam diverges. And actually for a large area single element transducer, the angle of divergence defined here in the figure on the bottom left can actually be calculated analytically by this uh, equation shown here. Uh, so often we want to focus these transducers, right? Because the, the focal zone, right? The, the area where the beam is skinniest uh, actually is where we have the best resolution in the lateral direction. Uh, so if you're imaging something, you want to focus it to that depth so that you have the best resolution at the depth that you're interested in, right? And here, uh, if you're using a single element transducer, they can be focused by using our curved piezoelectric elements or curved lenses. We can talk about these parameters such as the focal distance, right? Which is the distance between the transducer to the narrowest part of the beam. And the focal zone is just basically the region where the the beam's width is less than twice the width at the focal distance, right? There's also, when you're using these arrays, there's these transmit receive focus. So here, uh, array transducers are focused by applying timing delays between the transducer elements, right? And this, in this way, you can actually adjust the focal distance by adjusting the timing delays. And, these are used quite commonly because we often want to adjust the focal distance. When you talk about receive focus, you're talking about receiving the echo back, right? And here, echoes received by peripheral elements travel slightly further compared to central elements. So you have this concept of dynamic refocusing where you rephase the signals by introducing delays as a function of depth. So whenever we talk about an imaging modality, we're always wanting to talk about the spatial resolution, right? And obviously we live in a three-dimensional universe, so there are always three directions of spatial resolution. And unfortunately, in each imaging modality, they're always called something different. So in where in MRI, you call it, right, uh, frequency encoding, phase encoding, and slice selection. I'm an MRI guy, so that's what I'm used to. But in ultrasound, uh, we have different names for them. We have axial, lateral, and elevational resolution, right? So axial, which is kind of counterintuitive, is actually the direction along the beam's propagation, right? So it's the, it's the resolution along the direction that the beam is propagating. Then the two transverse uh, resolution measures are lateral, which is left to right, elevational up to down with respect the geometry of the transducer element. So axial resolution is determined by one half the spatial pulse length, where the spatial pulse length is the number of cycles in a pulse times the wavelength. And if you remember way back on one of the early slides, I said that the wavelength of the ultrasound beam is what ultimately determines the, the axial resolution. And you can improve axial resolution by using these shorter pulses or by using higher frequency pulses, right? Because a higher frequency, you have a lower wavelength, hence a lower spatial pulse length, hence a smaller axial resolution. A lateral resolution is the resolution along the left-right direction of the, of the slice that you're imaging, right? It's uh, also known as the azimuthal resolution, right? And this is determined by the beam diameter, which is determined by the width of the transducer element, or for a linear array, the number of active elements simultaneously fired, right? And this is obviously depth dependent, right? And it's best at the focal distance. Like we said, that's why you always want to uh, 
focus to the depth that you're actually interested in seeing the anatomy. Uh, for phased arrays, focusing to a specific depth is achieved by beam steering and this transmit and receive focusing that we discussed where you introduce these fractional timing delays. Um, and actually, you can be a little sophisticated and you can actually achieve multiple transmit receive focal zones so that you can try to keep the resolution roughly constant with depth, at least over some uh, uh, distance. The final measure of resolution is this elevational resolution. It's also known as the slice thickness dimension. And here, this is determined by the transducer element height. This is usually the worst measure of resolution for arrays. So now let's try to put everything together and talk about the imaging system as a whole, right? So as in most imaging modalities and any really uh, modern electronic systems, uh, there's a complex interplay of a number of different electronic systems, right? You have the pulsar, the beam former, the transmit receive switches, preamps, ADCs, a receiver, right? There's many of these components and we're gonna talk about some of the more important Right, so this beam former, right, or the pulsar, it's responsible, the, the beam former is responsible for generating electronic delays for individual transducer elements in an array, right? It's what achieves this transmit receive focusing that we are able to then adjust the focal zone. Uh, in phased arrays, this also achieves beam steering. The pulsar, but also known as the transmitter, provides the voltage to excite the piezoelectric effect, the piezoelectric element, which produces the ultrasound wave, but it also controls the output power transfer. You also have this transmit receive switch, which isolates the high voltage used for transmission from the sensitive amplification stages needed during receive mode. Uh, so basically it's just an electronic switch which determines whether you're operating under transmit mode or receive mode and make sure that you uh, sort of isolate those two modes from each other. So usually when, when you're uh, doing an ultrasound experiment and producing an image, right, you operate under this pulse echo operation mode where you transmit for a very short time, but then most of the time is spent listening or in receive mode, listening for uh, detected echoes, right? And then you repeat this process as you sweep over each A line in image. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a bit, right? But basically you have this period where you're not transmitting and you're just listening and, and sort of the distance and time between each transmit pulse right, is known as the pulse repetition period, and it's usually on the order of a half a millisecond. You can also talk about the pulse repetition frequency, one over the pulse repetition period, which is usually for ultrasound on the order of kilohertz, right? You then have these pre-amplification, right, where you amplify the, the incoming signal, and then analog digital conversion, where you convert the analog signal to a digital signal. You then have this receiver, which undergoes a number of image processing steps, such as time gain compensation, logarithmic compression, and then a few others. So log, log gain, time gain compensation is uh, quite important. Uh, basically, it's a time or depth dependent amplification of the returning signals. Uh, the reason why you want this is because obviously an ultrasound beam attenuates as it goes to deeper depths. So you would have an image that actually has a very dark signal at deeper depths, but you don't want this. You don't want the signal to fall off and you don't want the, the brightness of a feature in an image to be depth dependent. So time gain compensation is a correction algorithm that causes, a, a, yeah, a correction mechanism that causes it, uh, the signal at deeper depths to be increased while uh, signals at shallow depths are unchanged, right? It compensates for this beam attenuation. It's user adjustable, and you can adjust it by sliding these uh, potentiometers on the ultrasound uh, 
Uh, so here is uh, illustration of the effect of time gain compensation. So on the left hand side, you don't really have appropriate time gain compensation. And as you can see, as you get to deeper depths, the signal just starts to fall off, right? And uh, on the right, you do have appropriate time gain compensation. So you can actually see properly these highly reflective intervals, right? And basically when you're doing time gain compensation, what you want are to have two structures that are equally reflective to have the same bright, the same grayscale value, regardless of what depth they're at. You also have this logarithmic compression. Uh, so here it's related to the dynamic range, which like in other imaging modalities, is the range from the threshold signal level to the saturation signal level, right? And usually in ultrasound, you want a dynamic range no larger than 30 decibels. Um, but often after time gain compensation, you have a dynamic range that is much larger than that. So basically you, uh, you pass the signal through this lo logarithmic compression, which is essentially just a logarithmic filter, um, which compresses the dynamic range as shown here. In the uh, coming towards the end of the talk, uh, let's talk about the sort of major modes of ultrasound. Uh, so the first is A mode, B mode, and uh, M mode. So A, A stands for amplitude. And here uh, we're in an A mode display, you're plotting the echo amplitude as a function of time. And right, time is important because we can then relate that to depth via time of flight principles, right? So here is an A mode plot of the eye. And as you can see, you start with the eyelid, then you get to the cornea, then the anterior lens, posterior lens, and then eventually the retina. So B mode images, B stands for brightness, and B mode images are typically what we think of when we think of ultrasound images. So here is a B mode fetal images. Uh, and basically, we basically just take the A mode amplitude information, we convert that into a pixel intensity, and then you sweep for multiple A lines to produce a two dimensional picture. Right, this sweeping over multiple A lines can be done in a few different ways. The older way is what is known as this dynamic scanning. Uh, so here, basically, you take the single transducer element and you wobble it <laughs> along the patient. Uh, that obviously is not so optimal for uh, sensitivity and image quality. Uh, so now what is done is this electronic scanning where we use these arrays, right? And we, simul we, we uh, take turns firing different groups of elements and we sweep through the second dimension by firing different dimensions in the array, different elements in the array. Uh, so here, yeah, so here is a phased array and we actually use this electronic scanning to achieve uh, transmit, receive time and delays and beam steering. Right, you could all talk about the frame rate, right? Ultrasound, you're taking a real time image, right? So you actually have a number of different frames. This. Uh, determines this temporal resolution, right? So if you wanted to increase the temporal resolution or decrease the frame rate, uh, you have a couple of different choices, right? You could either uh, image at a different depth, which usually isn't so possible. You could decrease the number of A lines, right? Or you could decrease the field of view. Uh, so now moving on is M mode imaging. So M stands for motion. And here, basically, you plot B mode information as a function of time to track the motion of these different structures. Uh, so basically, on an M mode image, you have depth on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And here is an M mode image uh, shown where, as you can see, you have these two oscillations and you're imaging the heart. And so essentially, what you're seeing is the different cycles of the heart cardiac cycle, right? So diastole and systole. Yeah, so in conclusion, in conclusion, we've spoken about sort of the physics and engineering of ultrasound, right? So ultrasound images are produced 
by detecting these ultrasound wave echoes and then reconstructing an image, images by time of flight. So determining the depth at which a structure exists by knowing the time that it takes to travel from the transducer to the structure and then back to the transducer, right? There's a complex interplay of wave propagation physics and transducer engineering. Uh, to me, ultrasound imaging was always the most confusing imaging modality, uh, along with MRI. Um, but yeah, so today we really focused on sort of the physical aspects. Um, and in a future lecture, we're going to talk about some of the more clinical considerations like artifacts or QA that we need to do on ultrasound units and, and some clinical uh, uh, applications of ultrasound. And I utilized a few references. And with that, I'm willing to take any available questions.